people much beloved by God, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. This week's gospel passage picks up where we left off last week. Jesus has just turned the tables of the money changers. After that, he began to teach the people. In last week's text, the religious leaders tried to trap him, but instead had their selfish ambitions exposed. Last week I spoke about their desire to keep their power and to maintain their expectations. In this week's reading, Jesus does something absolutely amazing. He gave the Pharisees a God's eye view of all of history. That's incredible. That's a great claim to make about one simple parable. But let's look at this. There's a landowner who decides that he wants to build a vineyard. So he builds up a wall, and he puts up a tower, and he plants the vines, and he hires it out to tenants. That sounds really familiar. Where have I heard that before? It was in that Old Testament reading, wasn't it? That's right. Jesus is almost quoting Isaiah. The same thing is going on here. A vineyard is built. Now, in those days, winemaking was an incredibly lucrative business. Every religious ceremony in Israel had wine involved somehow. Not to mention the fact that in other countries besides the United States, wine is a staple in most homes. Israel was no different. So, the landowner decides that he's going to leave it out to tenants. Let them do the work for him and still make money, still have a profit. But when he sends his servants to collect the grapes, what happens? They're killed. The tenants kill the servants. They beat them and stone them and kill them. So the landowner does something that doesn't really make sense. He sends more servants to them even though he probably should have expected them to do the same thing, he thought, well, maybe if I send more, they'll act differently this time. Again, they beat and kill and stone his servants. Finally, he sends to them his own son. Now, remember, when we talk about parables, there tends to be a hidden fact behind a story. In this case, The landowner is God. He created a vineyard, Israel. He left it in the charge of tenants, the priests, the Levites, the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the chief priests who were questioning Jesus. And every time they would start to stray from the path that God had laid out for them, he would send a prophet. And you know what they did to those prophets? They beat and killed and stoned them every single time. Even the greatest of them, Elijah, was forced to live in the wilderness. Isaiah was ridiculed for his behaviors. Jeremiah, who helped to rebuild the temple, had to lament over Israel and their unwillingness to hear. So finally, what is God going to do except send his one and only son? Maybe they'll listen to him. Yet whenever the people of Israel were faced with God's only son, they killed him. God is still the ruler of all things. Now, although they killed him, we know that there's more to the story. But remember, parables don't just apply to the people that are hearing them. They apply to us too, right? I mean, if this didn't apply to us, honestly, would we be here right now? There are other things that we could probably be doing that would be more entertaining than this. Although I would love to tell you exactly the parts that you want to hear of this parable that they apply to you, I can't. I would love to tell you that you are the prophets, that you're beaten down by life and that that people around you are trying to suppress the gospel at all times and that 
by your sacrifice, you will earn your place amongst the saints, except I can't. See, if we're honest, we know that we're just like the Pharisees in this story. We like to think of the Pharisees as the religious elite, but really they were the laymen who were to proclaim the gospel, who were to proclaim God's word among the people of Israel. If we're really honest, we are the Pharisees in this story. What happens when the word of God is spoken to convict you? What happens when the law accuses you? I'm sure you'd all like to think that you're a lot like King David, who wrote in the Psalms, I love your law, O Lord. It is my meditation all the day long. And maybe you are. Maybe you do love the law of God. Maybe you love to read it. But remember, even this great king whom God called a man after his own heart, though he loved God's law, didn't enjoy it very much. When the law was brought against the king in the form of a parable, just like this one, he was broken. He felt the pain of God's word, driving him to despair in his sin. This is the truth. No one enjoys being disciplined. The author of Hebrews tells us that much. It requires brutal honesty and an ability to look at your own sin and accept that you need to change and accept that you are powerless to make that change. In the last month alone, the sermons have focused on forgiveness, holding grudges against your brother or your sister, expectations, and how in your sin all you can do is oppose God's will. Now those are just the issues that have come up in the sermons. Think about all the times that God's law has come against you in the past month, in your own personal life. Think of the struggles of our congregation. We don't like it. And sometimes that means lashing out at the people around us and trying to shift the blame of our sin onto someone else. And sometimes it means lashing out at the preacher for speaking the truth. I've had it happen to me several times. Then again, I've also lashed out at my pastor for speaking the truth to me. Just ask Preston. Sometimes our distaste for the law means that we lash out at God. At least the Pharisees had the wherewithal to realize that Jesus was talking about them. Remember when we talk about Holy Scripture, I've said since my first day here, this isn't about you. It's about Christ for you. Thanks be to God that this is about Christ for you. Remember the main thing is the love of God in Christ Jesus. That is to say that this story is about the love that God has displayed through Christ Jesus for you. So where is God in this parable? Well, remember, the parable is about a cast of characters. And the character who shows the most generosity is God every single time. Just like that really generous landlord. God was so generous that he gave his people of Israel several opportunities to repent. He did this knowing that they may abuse and kill his prophets and his preachers. But he loved them enough to try again and again and again. And finally, he sent his son, moreover his only son, so that they could again hear the word of God. God loved you and was so generous that he gave you preachers again and again and again. Not just here in this place, but in the world, all throughout your life, so that you may hear the gospel. And even when you spurned them, even when you refused to listen, he still offered up his son for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. 
And although Jesus was killed, that is not the end of the story. The vineyard is the promise. See, although Israel rejected the promise of God, God gave it out to those tenants who would live in it. God gave the promise of the kingdom to you just as much as he has given it to the kingdom of Israel. Now in your baptism, you share in that promise. We've been faced with death a lot lately. We've been talking to people like Matt, Pastor John, and others who have struggled whether to seek treatment or to go home to their Father in Heaven. And the greatest comfort that any of them could receive was to hear that they have the promise of Christ and Him crucified that assures them that they will be with Him in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Anytime you need a reminder of that promise, we come here. We have the word that although we don't always love to hear it, we receive it as a gift from God. We have our baptismal font standing before us as a reminder of the dip we took into death and the resurrection that we have gained, just like Asher experienced a few months ago. And finally, we have the bread and wine that Michael and Drew now get to join with us in to receive the body and blood of their Lord, to receive the body and blood of your Lord. This is the promise that comes from that word. Although we hate to hear the accusation of the law, when the gospel comes after it, it is all the sweeter. When you hear that your sin is grievous and deep and dark, it is all the sweeter to hear that you are forgiven on account of Christ and him crucified for the forgiveness of your sins. This is most certainly true. Amen. Hello, I'm Vicar Aaron Dawson, and I hope that you heard comfort, forgiveness, and the promises of Christ in this sermon. For more sermon videos like this, information about our church, and promises of Christ, you can visit us at sjlcmetro.com. That's s-j-l-c-m-e-t-r-o dot c-o-m. Thank you. And God bless you and keep you in his grace.